Good evening, everybody. I'm Esther Rosenberg, and I'm the Artistic and Executive Director of the Eastside Arts Society, which produces what is now the 25th Annual Eastside Culture Crawl. Yay, yay, yay. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are currently working and living on the um, on the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations um, territory on whose land we live and work on. And I am honored to be able to do that, or we are honored to be able to do that on this land. I'd now like to introduce you to Carlin Yandel. Carlin is with us now, second year in a row with Talking Art um, series. Uh, Carlin's Carlin Yandel's art practice draws on her previous career as a print journalist to engage community through simple handmaking methods and found manufactured materials. Her works include public art installations, painting, fiber arts, and sculpture. She writes on the creative process, and you can find that work at carlinyandel.com. So I'll pass this over to you, Carlin, to um, introduce the um, participants. Thank you, Esther. Yeah, this is the third and last talking art panel of this 25th anniversary year of the East Side Culture Crawl. And tonight we're continuing this overall theme of exploration as the prime mover of art practices. So tonight we're lucky to have three member artists here who have dared to explore where other artists have fear to tread and that is the business of selling their art. They are Gil Benzian, Jeff Wilson, and Arlie Wood. And before we get to the uh, introductions of each, I'd just like to give a little overview of the current business conditions for the, um, for the benefit of those tuning in. Makers were already up against ever increasing exploitative global trade of handmade products before the global pandemic lockdown, many show and sell opportunities. And we live in one of the most expensive cities in the world. So much of our creative energy is spent on actually just trying to find studio space. And um, like a multi-year lease would be a dream. But tonight we're talking about why you must keep going because really if you self-identify as an artist or maker, you have no choice but to keep at it. Artist is not a job. It's uh, the job might be everything else you do that supports you to continue to do you. And by sharing in the struggle, you are creating community and participating in community. And you, I feel like you can't put a price on being part of a pack that has your back. So I hopefully I'm giving a little bit of like a reality check, but also, you know, some incentive to move <laughs> ahead. So having said that, I have to say that, um, I'm, I'm, first I'm gonna introduce um, Gil Benzian. Gil is a woodworker and jeweler who creates unique pieces in his Vancouver studio. We're gonna talk about his studio soon. <laughs> He's specialized in wood wedding rings for nearly 15 years, but is now focusing on a nonprofit initiative, heavy metal rings. Gil says his nonprofit will produce tungsten carbide rings inlaid with pieces of guitar strings, bass strings, and drumsticks from heavy metal musicians, with all profits going towards mental health initiatives. And Gil says in a recent blog that he's been making rings for so long, I feel as though my craft is woven into my very identity. And that will be a recurring theme tonight for sure. Does that? sound like a reasonable kind of encapsulating your practice at this moment in time? That sounds right on the nose. It is very much a part of my identity. It is woven into my DNA. Um, uh, almost 15 years. It's uh, It's been a very long time. Not all of those years have been good years, and yet I keep doing it uh, year after year after year yeah. after year. Yeah, we're, we're masochists like that. Yes, yes we are. Yes, so we're going to get, we're going to dig into that a little deeper. I just want to introduce Jeff Wilson, based out of Portside Studios in Vancouver. He grew up in Edinburgh and is trained as a structural geologist. 
He worked in mineral exploration around the world, settling in Vancouver in 2004, and took art classes at Emily Carr University, which kickstart a hobby that transitioned to a full-time art practice in 2013. He was finalist in the inaugural Salt Spring National Art Prize mm. and appeared in the recent TV show, Landscape Artist of the Year Canada. His work is held in numerous private, public and corporate collections. And anything you want I should add right now to that, Jeff? No, I think that that's good enough. Good enough move, for now. Move, yeah, yeah, move on to Arlie. Moving on, moving on. <laughs> okay, Arlie Wood studied at Concordia University in Montreal and earned her BFA at the University of Hertfordshire in the UK. She has exhibited her work locally, nationally, and internationally, and her work is in private and corporate collections, in hotels, and in various interior design magazines, including Canadian House and Home. Wood's paintings have also been used in films and television programs. Her work can be found at Art Interiors in Toronto and Vancouver Art Gallery Sales and Rental Program, among others. So that's my introduction. And just, there's just so much that I want to talk about and I have to focus in. And this is one thing I've learned already, looking at all three of your works, your, your practices, is that you all three have works that are very identifiable to you. And I realized that I can learn a lot from you because I'm a little this, I'm a little, every time I get the introduction, it's like, I'm this and I'm also this and I'm also that. And I'm kind of thinking that this might be a key to just how you work in business is actually have something that's very identifiable to you in particular. Anybody want to kick that off? How about Jeff? Uh, I would absolutely agree. I mean, there are literally tens of thousands of painters across North America and uh, really what you want to do is develop a style where you can walk into a room or a gallery, you can see something on the wall, and even if you don't like it, you can immediately recognize it as by an artist, and that's something I've tried to pursue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have you gone in different directions and then had to pull yourself back? Um, I have, I make a, a deliberate choice to paint in in discrete collections uh, so that allows me to a keep from going mad painting one thing but uh, have uh, identifiable canons of work that people can can home in on you know so people know specific areas that I work in that's, that's a deliberate choice mm -hmm. yeah so that requires some self-editing <clears throat> on oh, your for part sure. yeah I mean I take thousands of tens of thousands of photographs and I work on very specific compositions. But what you find is that there are certain subjects that are that just turn out better than they should for your for your given level of uh, 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 ability, whether it's urban landscapes or uh, neon signs or whatever. And uh, and what you do is you get feedback that they are better, so you tend to gravitate towards them, but try to vary it amongst different specific subjects. Uh, so you're not uh, going stir crazy painting the same old alleyway uh, in your studio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that balance there, keeping it distinct but also not being repetitive. Yeah, so the, the idea is to, yeah, the idea is to 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 create a style which is recognizable regardless of the subject that you choose. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, if I could just move to Gil on that, because you 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 have very very specific work as well. The when I'm looking at your rings, and I have to say, all three of your um, websites. I don't. I, I, can I call them shop shop websites? I don't really know what the word is, but um, online it's stores. yes, online. Thank you, online stores. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's very specific. And now I know I read, I relate that item to you. Did you, do you feel that you were ever finished doing that, those rings or did it, never mind circumstances, just, just in terms of your interest in, in your, uh, in the, in the wedding rings? Never, never. Each ring is different. Each ring is something unique made specifically for a client. Each ring is going to ideally spend the rest of its life uh, on the finger of someone completely 
and totally different. Um, it's a new challenge every time. Um, people ask for all kinds of interesting materials to be inlaid, all kinds of different woods. It gives me, even though I'm making the same uh, product in essence every time, each one has its own set of challenges. Each, each one has its own set of uh, surprises. Each one uh, has its own set of frustrations as well. So it really surprisingly keeps things quite varied and quite interesting. Mm -hmm. I definitely see that. You can definitely, I don't <clears throat> know how exactly, but the joy of, of, of your making really comes through with your sites. And I guess that's the key is it doesn't look like you're an anonymous, you get on some kind of an assembly line, putting things together that this is a really a, kind of a soulful exercise. Even this picture that is up right now, it's like a, kind of this very small, intimate act of of making with all your tools around. That's that seems like a, like a a great place to go to every day. That's usually where, where you'll find me for hours on end, completely ignoring uh, any desire to eat, drink, go to the bathroom, anything along those lines. I'm quite laser focused when I'm uh, in front of my workbench. Mm -hmm. This is what I mean when I say that. Being an artist is not a job. For the job, you can lay down tools and walk away. But this one, yeah, it, bathroom breaks are like, you can wait till they get very extreme, I know. You, you can indeed. Yeah. And I'm going to talk about this further with, with uh, Artie. But I'm, I, I really want to bring in this. Um, I don't know if, you're, if you know Bruce Mao, the, the Canadian designer, innovator, art educator. In the 90s, he came up with what he calls his incomplete manifesto for growth. And every time I get a little frustrated with um, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? What does it even mean? What's what, what, like, like, am I wasting my time? He has these sort of 43, 43 little points in his incomplete mess, uh, manifesto. But the first one is one that I think that is really applying to you, Gil. And it says, allow events to change you. You have to be willing to grow. Growth is different from something that happens to you. You produce it, you live it. The pr prerequisites for growth are the openness to experience events and the willingness to be changed by them. Can you talk a little bit about the change that you're going through as you've uh, outlined a little bit in your recent blog? Uh, certainly. Uh, and, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons for the change is that it's... Um, it's getting a little bit tough to be found uh, amongst what is essentially a sea of mass production these days. The problem with rings is that there are a lot of people on a platform like Etsy, let's say, who Etsy has changed a lot since its inception. Um, they've gone on to um, allow vintage items, allow craft supplies, and they needed to do that in order to survive. I don't think they were making a lot of money just off of a small cut from handmade goods, but in doing so, it's kind of opened the door to a number of kind of resellers who, who uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to outright accuse anyone of this, but you can check out on Etsy uh, any given, say, tungsten ring, and then go find the exact same tungsten ring produced overseas on AliExpress for a small fraction of the price. Oh. Um, and unfortunately, these items are priced at way less than I could ever make something. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is less incentive to buy one of my pieces when someone can buy another ring that they, you know, may think is handmade or the handmade aspect may not be as important to them. Uh, so rather than kind of double down and say, no, I'm going to stick to my guns. I'm going to make this handmade item forever and ever and ever, even if nobody buys it, uh, I've decided to try to find a hybrid model. Um, and my venture through heavy metal rings, it, they are tungsten carbide cores, uh, produced overseas, like any other uh, any other mass-produced ring, but each one is then hand inlaid with uh, something unique, something special, a guitar string or a bass string or, or a piece of drumstick from any given heavy metal musician. I'm actually wearing one of them right now. 
Oh, uh -huh. a little tough to see. Uh, oh, I can see it. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Um, and and uh, you know that it's it's an idea that I had uh, a long, long time ago, and I decided uh, instead of approaching it as a private um, art practice kind of venture, I decided to turn it into a nonprofit instead, mm -hmm. which in and of itself has been quite the interesting journey and challenge. It's more more of that exploration into the business side. Oh man, it is uh, it is uncharted waters for me. There was a <laughs> steep learning curve, <laughs> but I think I'm figuring it out uh, little by little. Yeah, there is no artist business school, is there? Like, <laughs> you know, you go to school and you learn all these things, but business isn't not so not so much. It's a good business idea. Somebody should open that up. Yeah, always thinking it. Always thinking about another way to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's Arlie, that's, does, do you feel that sometimes, because I know you have this beautiful site and beautiful online shop, um, do you feel that you are in competition with other painters or do you, are you dealing with people that you already have a connection with as, as buyers? Um, yeah, I guess the online shop part I've had only really set up properly since COVID. So I had like an online more portfolio, but you couldn't actually shop there. So that was like a new thing that I kind of put together during COVID. And now I've kind of realized how valuable that is. But at the same time, what you're saying is now you're all of a sudden um, not competing, but you're, you're, you're trying to get people to come, you know, to find you. So how, how do you do that? Um, it's, through social media or, you know, through actual in-person events, but you are um, still trying to get through that seat. Like so many people have um, online shops on Etsy and everything. So how do you get through that sea of that to, you know, for people to find your site? Like once they come to the site, that's great, but funneling them to that, it's quite, uh, it's challenging. I think it's quite challenging. Uh, sorry, just to, you're, you're telling your people to, to go to, you're directing them to that site to purchase? Is that the idea? That's the challenge? No, it's um, finding enough people that, you know, um, basically like if someone's doing a web search or trying to find your website, like they're not going to find my website unless they are already connected to me. Right. So, right. Um, it, it's a it's a great way for people to after they um, come in contact with your work to then go and purchase it, mm -hmm. but it's a challenge when like especially during COVID and in the sea of everybody marketing themselves for them to find your, okay. your website. That's mm -hmm. what I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and you have very looking at your own site. You have mm -hmm. so many different ways of that people can. Um, that people can um, support your practice. You can, you have paintings, but then you have, or, or mixed media work, but then you also have them in different forms. Can you talk about how those developed and do, did you just sort of do them all at once or you do them one at a time? Like how, what's like your Like you process? talking the calendars and the prints yeah, and all the, the, other the things. Masks, yeah, like the masks and yeah. Um, I just slowly, like most of it actually really came out during COVID out of like, um, I, um, yeah, I think I, I was seeing other people doing it and having success do that, doing that. And um, I learned about trying to have um, different streams of income. So instead of being totally dependent on selling original work, you can at the same time um, service other people who maybe his budget are smaller or who are collectors of yours, but they have already got work. Um, maybe they'd like to buy a mask or a print or give something as a gift, but they need something in a lower price point. And it was kind of my way of being able, like what I used to do um, was make a lot of small pieces. And I was finding, I just really wanted to move away from getting into like a production line of the original work. So uh -huh. I was trying to think, okay, how can I continue offering things at a lower price or to people who, um, maybe already have the originals without actually physically making all these small pieces and continue to have the larger work. So maybe doing the prints will feed 
the ability like so when you plan your time you are making the larger works and that's a time when you don't think about the business side and you're not doing that and then you you make prints of them and then that's a different you know that's a different process that you can kind mm -hmm. of I'm, I'm just finding lately like they're linking those two things in the studio is very it, it doesn't really work <laughs> it's oh it's very hard to it it's it, business wise it's fine but mentally it's very difficult to create the work and be free when you create it and then when I do the selling it's a separate it's a separate time you know so yeah. um I put together the collections which would be uh -huh. like that series and then um and then after I figure out how I'm going to do the prints and how I'm going to do the marketing side of it, when you right. try to overlap them, I find it doesn't, it just doesn't feel right. So yeah, that, um, that was kind of my question for you is that how can you be making original work and be doing all these other parts of the, the business side, the, the yeah. all I, these different, I, I don't even have the language for it. The, I want to say marketing, but that's not right but offering oh, yeah. different kinds of formats. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it's just, uh, I, I mean, I find that quite fun and challenging to try to think of different ideas of, you know, like all this, I, you know, this calendar idea, I thought, okay, well, um, yeah, you just, you just have, you see other people doing it maybe, or you think, oh, that would be a nice, and then, and then you get down and you realize like actually how much work it is to put together something like that. And it does end up taking, you know, like, a lot of time away from the studio practice but then I say to myself well if I wasn't doing the calendars you know maybe I wouldn't be able to do the studio practice so freely as well right like one feeds mm -hmm. the other mm -hmm. um and it is a way of also getting your work into the hands of different people that wouldn't know it's it's like a starter you know mm -hmm. it's a starter collection in a way mm -hmm. um because you have to realize that not everybody um is going to be able to buy an original piece. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's just a different, it's a, just a different stream of income and it's a different thought process. <laughs> um, you do run out of time though, of like enough time to use, but like I would say 50% of the time is spent on marketing, right? So okay. that's not desirable for most people. I I kind of like it in, a, in, in part of me does, cause it's a bit of a challenge to try to figure out a puzzle in a way like okay how can I and you're always learning new new techniques new skills you know web you know web all of a sudden you're a web designer all of a sudden you're you're learning how to do blogs like all of those things it's I find that challenging I like that mm -hmm. but I do find sometimes I'm being pulled too far in that direction and then I'm you know I have to say okay close the door to that right. it's studio time right, right? so yeah. it's a balancing act for sure and the, are you in conversation with other artists about like sharing tips or is this something you're yeah. sort of like a solo project for you? Uh, like, like in the last um, over COVID, I actually um, ended up, I have a, a group of other artists from um, different parts of the US and Canada. We meet weekly and we have like brainstorming sessions on, or you, you kind of go through the issues that you're having with specifically the business. Oh. that's been really helpful I had never had that before so um it's quite like a lot of people are having the same issues in different parts of the you know we're all kind of struggling with the mass production and how to get your um you know how to navigate social media you know as everything is changing and so it's nice to have a group um that you can talk to about um all those little those little details um mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so I do have a little bit of a support group now, and that's just definitely been through COVID. I realized, you know, you need that because you weren't having those regular meet, like meetups with people and like I do in the hallway at, at Parker Street, you know, that's when you kind of have those, but we were, we were not getting that. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's fantastic. And, and, and again, like getting back to what I started off talking about is that actually building communities yeah totally is really the big maybe yeah. the end point or the, the it's necessary and it's also maybe the big reward I feel like that's one thing like that was one of my my top goals was to build community um and try to figure out like through teaching and through like offering myself to work you know to work 
for free and, and, and learning that way and, and also just trying to create these little groups. Um, and I think that that's, that's how you're going to grow. Um, mm -hmm. And I, and it's just, yeah, it feels like that's the most important thing is the community aspect of it. Cause doing it alone is, I don't know, it's just not the same, <laughs> Yeah, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jeff, you, you could, I know you could speak quite um, at length about how to, to create works that are more accessible okay. to, yeah, would Speaking you? At length, are you are you calling me a windbag here? I would uh, love Carol. you to speak at length. The floor <laughs> is yours. The old smoothie. So, what was the question again? I'm, <laughs> I'm interested in how you uh, you've spoken before about making your paintings more accessible to people who maybe can't. Uh, you mean in terms of, out of reach the prints? Well, sure, sure. So, I mean, I like to work it at scale. So up to six feet by four feet, but there's not many people have the, the kind of scratch to, to, to drop down six large for a, a painting. But um, what I do is I produce pieces on a variety of sizes. So there's 30 by 40s and then like uh, 24 by 24 and then 10 by 10 and they're like 250. And then, um, and then I do the prints and like Arlie says, they're kind of the gateway drug of the, of the art practice. They go for you know cheap and cheerful thirty bucks a pop, and uh, and they've been fun to they've been fun to do, and it just gives people the opportunity to get something that's affordable, and accessible, and uh, get it up on their wall, and then at some point in the future, if they get a if they get a new job or a new house or a, a raise or whatever that is, they might think you know, um, or in the case of the pandemic, there's a lot of folks who. We're sitting at home going stir crazy, looking at empty walls, you know, watching their bank balance uh, tick up. And so they started buying originals, you know, and anecdotally, a lot of my peers have found that their sales over the last year were actually very good mm -hmm. as a result. But yeah, the prints are, you know, the sort of the, the, the entry level for that. And they've been a fun thing to do. Right. And you have it at that. A cheap and cheerful thirty dollar price point, and a lot, a big variety too. I noticed. Yeah, well, uh, what happened was I was just making them up, and anecdotally, I'd heard that they were quite popular in the crawl in previous years, when um, when uh, COVID uh, locked down. I thought, well, what am I going to do with these damn prints? So uh, I looked at various folks, and they had their Etsy store. So I set up an Etsy store, and it kind of. Uh, it kind of took off, you know, and that has uh, independently of of what I might think of a painting, people have have their opinion about what they think mm -hmm. is a painting. So it's nice, it's nice to get feedback from that as to what other people think are uh, are my strongest pieces and which of those translate into uh, translate into prints. So it's a an iterative process, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I chose to do it not as a loss leader, but I don't really make much money from the print, um, but uh, but they are a way that somebody can get introduced to the work, you know, and then right. and move on from there. And do you find that most of your buyers are uh, buying your work because they recognize the area that's specific to their area, or? Um, I wouldn't, uh, I don't have enough buyers that I could really generalize like that, but um, certainly uh, if people feel a connection either to the artist or the subject, there is, there is a stronger reaction, you know, whether it's a nostalgic feeling for a neon sign in the downtown east side or, um, uh, or you know, a painting of active passage, you know, on the way to Victoria, if if you can sort of stumble upon subjects that people feel a connection to, rightly or wrongly, that, that definitely makes a difference, you know, and uh, maybe it translates into a, a sale and maybe it doesn't, but you, you sort of develop a feeling for stuff that you both enjoy painting and is likely to find a buyer at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all gold. It's all gold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Gil, you just um, when you're talking about um, materials, or this is the image that people, um, Jeff is talking about the image that might have um, some sort of affinity to the buyer. I'm thinking also about these new tungsten rings that you're that you're embarking on this whole project, and um, th that would be the same thing, would it not? That people have this affinity to that specific material, like the heavy metal genre. Oh, certainly, it is. Um, uh, I mean, I'm I'm aiming for a very very specific market uh, <laughs> with this venture, but it's uh... it's a big one. It's it's a big one, but at the same time, this is this is my idea of starting small uh, mm -hmm. with a very very specific genre, a very very specific market. I uh, don't don't let the the blue shirt fool you. I was a heavy metal kid with the black uh, metal shirts, long hair, and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I I started with what I knew, um, and that's that's exactly it. Uh, it's not just in terms of this product, it's in terms of um, many of the rings that I've made, I use a wood that certain people have an affinity for. You know, a lot of people had their first date under a chestnut tree, let's say. And so when they propose or when they get married, they want their rings made out of chestnut. It's wonderful, I love it. Yeah, um, that's cool. I use a lot of inlays and you can see um, on the top, the darker ring with the, with the red inlay, it's crushed brick. And I've had a lot of people send me little pieces of brick from their houses, little stones from you know, anywhere they, they may have traveled. Uh, someone who has become actually a very good friend of mine uh, actually sent me a piece from, the, uh, uh, from when she went to go summit Everest. She picked up a few rocks along the way and I crushed them up and put them into a ring for her. Uh, so it's that connection that makes each one of these special. And every time I have a finished ring and I know that somebody out there, uh, somebody who I may have never even met or, and never will because they're on the other side of the world, knowing that they're going to have a special connection to something I just made is... I have never found anything that replicates that feeling. Mm -hmm. So you're 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 actually just expanding this this core um, relationship with the rings with with these new he the heavy metal. Exactly. I'm, I'm yeah keeping that same kind of connection, uh, mm -hmm. trying trying to apply it to something a little bit different. Yeah, but you mm. seem really energized about it, so that's great. Uh, I, you know, you have no choice but to be energized about mm -hmm. it. Uh, yeah. The reality is that as energizing as it is, it's also very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to earn a living through your work, through your art. It's very difficult to balance between spending time making in the studio and spending time running a business, which is what you have to do and all of that um setting up an online store interacting with customers shipping product uh um, managing social media accounts it's a lot of work mm -hmm. it's a it's a full-time job and a half so you can let it uh crush you or you can try to remain optimistic and energized and keep going mm -hmm. yeah and so how what how do you feel just on the surface of all that marketing business end of things are do you loathe it or are you kind of like arlie which is like you know she's actually taking it on as a project and finding it kind of interesting uh i honestly wish i didn't have to do it <laughs> <laughs> not so much <laughs> not so much it's, uh, it's not my favorite pastime. Uh, i i enjoy a little bit of time in front of a screen like the next person if it's a matter of you know watching uh something on netflix but when you have to spend hours in front of a screen to get your work out there uh, it becomes a little bit draining and it's not um it's not the romantic notion of the artist who just gets to make something in their studio all day. It's the, it's the gritty reality of, uh, of being on the ground and, and figuring out, okay, how am I going to pay rent this month with all of these things that I'd like to make? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Unless, unless, you've, unless you have a benefactor or you've re retired with a nice pension, you well, pretty much have to have a hustle. That's it. If we uh, if we can only go back to uh, the Renaissance when uh, when uh, many of the artists had patrons and uh, in <laughs> studios uh, filled with helpers who just wanted 
buddy under the master. Yeah, I think we need that. Like, I think we need to bring back the, although I don't know how much. Oh, I don't know. Would that control be great to be under a patron? Like, what would that be? I don't know. If we you would know if be able to manage. Wants to be my patron, like, go, go right ahead. I, I will let somebody support me and just let me make art. I'm, I'm fine with that kind of arrangement. Arlie? I, I don't know what if they made you make the art that that they wanted you to make because I don't think they got to choose and that's like working in the commercial art business is you're basically working you know because this was the choice I felt like I had to make was like okay are you going to make work that you want to make then you better figure out how you're going to sell it or are you going to get a job working for someone else and you, using your art, art to, to for you know for what they want to do and you know I chose the other route which like you know I, I say I'm enjoying the challenge of it but when I'm sitting there and you know setting up the web shop I, I wasn't really enjoying it but you know you, you have to kind of you know, embrace it yeah. embrace it embrace the challenge but there's definitely moments where I would of course I would 100% if I could just be in the studio just making and not thinking about it I mean that's that's a dream but that's not yeah it's not it's not possible <laughs> you make a very very good point and i think the goal ultimately is to find a balance between the two there's something that allows you to yeah. still be creative still pursue what you would like to make but at the same time pay the rent and that's why lots of people like you know i i can see why teaching would be in like in and that's you know one method of doing that is like you can run workshops or you can do something else that runs so basically this multiple streams of income idea is i think for unless you're lucky enough to have um, so much demand for your paintings that you can continue and that you can do the kind of work that you want to do because you don't want to get trapped in you know basically people only I mean that's happened to me before is people only want um, a certain type of work and I don't want to do it anymore and so when mm -hmm. I stopped doing it I had to give up all of those sales from that and I had to and that was a tough um transition so you know but you have to kind of follow what you really you know the reason why you're making the work is because you you feel true to the work so um it, it can sometimes be hard when you're done with that series but people still want to people still ask me for the same thing and I you know I could make it again but I just have to say no so to figure out another way mm -hmm. um yeah so Jeff kind of, did, did you want to weigh I, in on that I typically say yes um, oh well, but, great. <laughs> I do a lot of um, I do a lot of commission work, and uh, and it can be everything from like a dog portrait to a a head frame from a, a mine or or a village in in in, in Scotland. Um, yeah. But one one of the reasons that I've chosen to work in specific series is that you know um, I'm just working on an urban landscape just now. I finished a, uh, a neon sign the other week. Uh, my next one is uh, a village up in, up in up in Yukon. Next one after that is, um, you know, and, and, and so I, I vary amongst the different themes. So that allows me the um, the, the luxury of, uh, of moving, of not painting the same thing week after week because I, Arlie's exactly right. A lot of artists they get boxed into producing one theme that they know will sell, and that often the commercial galleries specifically ask for. I mean, in my case, I've been lucky that different commercial galleries I work with respond to different collections of my work. So I've been able to produce different pieces of work for different commercial galleries. Mm. But you have like a common thread through your work too that you can see like even if you're doing different subject matter you can yeah. see it's recognizable so yeah it's and not was, like you're changed to you know no but, but, but for example but for example i've been wanting to do trees for a while and mm. uh, if i started doing trees it'd be really weird you know like is this guy having a midlife crisis another midlife crisis <laughs> um but but just recently, I landed uh, um, uh, an art residence up in Prince Rupert, um, and one of the things an art residence allows you to do mm -hmm. is produce a, a coherent body of work on whatever that is, and there's plenty of trees up there, without it looking totally weird, you know. Yeah. 
So in the case of Saskatchewan, I did a collection in the back of a, an art residence in Saskatchewan because um, I wanted to do some prairie stuff, but I didn't want it to be just too much of a departure. So you can do the work and see how buyers respond to it. And if they do, then you continue making it. If they don't, then you can just close it off and, and, and move on. Mm -hmm. That's smart. So you're very responsive to a buying, uh, the buyer as opposed to, I want to do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, the, the I found from experience that um, a, a coherent body of work is easier to pitch to um, uh, public art galleries and commercial art galleries. You know, they, they want, a, they want a, a coherent body of work that uh, speaks to your view of a particular subject and um, uh, and and if you're lucky, they'll 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 take you on. And once you've established that, you can work within that work within that uh, within that theme. And as I say, I've been lucky enough that different commercial and public galleries have responded to different um, uh, different themes within my within my canon. You know, and maybe they didn't. And sometimes it takes a few years before you find the right platform for what you are producing, you know. Um, but if you have enough productivity to produce work, you know, a, a, a consistent clip at a certain level, then you have that luxury to, to pitch different um, subjects at different organizations and take advantage of the, the opportunities when they come up. So impressive. Oh, that's a challenge is the, the amount of work, like what you're talking about to be able to produce multiple, cause that, that depending on the speed that you work or, you know, yeah. whatever other things, that's great that you can. Yeah. Well, you see, I've got, I've, I've got fat thumbs and fat fingers. Uh, and so I paint real loose at a large scale. Um, so it, uh, I mean, it looks great on the screen, but it looks kind of rough and loose in reality, but uh, I have that luxury that um, I work uh, big and, and fast, you know, so. Do you have the luxury of time? Um, Jeff, well, do you, paint, do you, are you in there every day? I, I paint nine to 12, Monday to Friday. And then, um, and then afternoons I do everything else, whether it's client care, uh, social media, um, pickups, drop-offs, um, grant applications, um, all, all that other kind of stuff. So, you know, um, I, I don't know about you, uh, Carolyn, but I'm not 21 uh, anymore and my hands can't take uh, doing six, seven hours in the, uh, mm -hmm. the studio. So I found that, you know, a morning in the studio is fine and the, the light's better in my studio at that time of day. And then in the afternoon, uh, I do everything else, you know, and, um, and it's I don't all, find It's all that. still in the project of, of your art practice, though. It's just part of the job. Right. All, all these other things, it's, um, although it's a, it's a calling, it's still a job, you know, and, um, and everything else is just part of that job. And uh, I, I did a, a, a thing with Brendan Tang one evening, and he was saying that on average, you know, the really successful artists, they maybe spend 30% of their time in the studio, and the other two thirds of the time is, is everything else, you know, so I figure at 50% time, I'm doing well. Yeah, I don't think many people realize how much time is spent on that side of things, the business side of things. I think that people assume you're sort of 80% doing the art and then you kind of put, you know, post some things and then that's done. And I, don't, I, think, yeah. I think by the time you have an infrastructure around you to market your work on your behalf, you can do that. But most of us are not... Uh, and are, are not likely to be in that position. So you either accept it's part of the job and and get to get to you know not enjoy it, but accept it's part of the job, uh, or you become increasingly bitter. Mm -hmm. But you know when I'm thinking, or you hire someone to do it, or you hire people to do it, which is another thing I've been looking. You know, you outsource a lot of your stuff, and then you but you have to then sell much more paint you have to be able to produce more to pay for that so there is mm -hmm. that other the, there are people who are doing that too and that are doing well um, but 
it's a bit more of a financial risk at the beginning, right? That you have to put in to paying other people. So, mm -hmm. and if you keep going in that down that road, you, you're you're kind of a manager as well. Totally, yeah. And then you're you're you, it becomes a, still a challenge to be able to get enough studio time because then yes, you're managing those people to, and then having to keep up with that level of. Um, uh, the love that level of sales to pay all of that so th that's definitely another because that's what I tried to do with the other um, with the other the prints of the things was just to hire someone to do all of that side um, but it's not that simple when you're I, yeah it's it's good once you get going but it it's a consistent cost that you have to you incur so it's it's riskier than just being yourself you know okay I have to pay my rent and then I pay myself whatever I can, mm -hmm. you know? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that I would just want to, listening to you and Jeff talk <laughs> about all these, these all these little tentacles. Details. I just feel like now I just want to bury myself in my artwork <laughs> and don't talk to me. Yeah, so I know that feeling. Don't yeah. talk to me, I'm an artist. And that gets to this another one. I'm going to bring it up uh, again. Uh, Bruce Mao's uh, talking his incomplete manifesto for growth. He says, "Don't be cool." This is number fourteen. Cool is conservative fear dressed in black. Uh -oh. Sucks. <laughs> Free yourself from limits of this source. So I kind of get that. That's it's easy to kind of say. You know, I'm an artist. I don't really deal with that stuff. I'm kind of, you know, like I don't want to talk about marketing or business. I just, you know, I'm the, I'm the artist. And I guess that's what it's like, resist that. Just take some chances and 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 boldly go and and try things out. And I, I see that that's what all three of you are, are doing. Just keep keep trying and 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 seeing where things land and see what works and what doesn't work. That's not about does that resonate at all with you, Gil? Oh, absolutely. Um, I've had so many ventures that haven't worked. Uh, so many product expansions, uh, uh, product uh, product line attempts that haven't really worked. And actually, um, the the rings weren't part of the plan when I when I first started devising a plan all those years ago. Uh, the rings were in reaction to what people were liking and to mm -hmm. what people were willing to pay for. You know, I, I started out my um, um, my craft uh, practice as a cabinet maker, uh, and then shortly thereafter discovered that people were willing to pay more for a wedding ring than they were willing to pay for a dining room table. Wow. Uh, so <laughs> I very, very quickly pivoted. Uh, and am very fortunate that I still love what actually makes money. Mm -hmm. um, I know not a lot of people are in that position, and I have to acknowledge every day how lucky I am that I have been able to live for this long in this way, thanks to the work I produce. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it seems like it's more and more the exception than the norm. Um, and I, yeah, I feel very lucky, very fortunate. Yeah. And even though you're, I'm sure everybody here has had a, a moment where they're like, it's all going to pot. It's all not working, but then something changes, something, you make a shift. And I'm thinking you're, you say you're out of your studio pretty soon. I am. Is that right? So yeah, I know about that one. Yeah. It's and so, so, you know, this is another shift, but it's not the end, right? Well, that's just it. It's, uh, it's an unfortunate reality of Vancouver. Space here comes at a pretty insane premium, both living space and working space. Uh, I mean, to, that, that's a, a nice shot of my, <laughs> my current space that unfortunately at the end of the month, uh, shortly after the crawl, I'll have to clear out and find a new, uh, a new place for, but uh, space is hard to come by. When you do find it, it's expensive. Oftentimes it's very, very small, sometimes not very suitable. Uh, that applies to living space as well. I'm, I'm talking to you from my apartment. In order to set this up, I had to basically put my couch in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> These are all going to be good. These are going to be those cold winter stories later on. I know it. 
you're laughing, but I have no idea how I'm going to make tea later. <laughs> I got I to climb over this thing to. Uh... Well, but, one thing that's going to save you for sure is that attitude, the uh, the humor. Because I mean, what else? And your community, right? Your your growing community of uh, like minded um, individuals who really believe in your work. Absolutely, and and that's what I love about the crawl is that it is an opportunity to to connect with this entire community of artists and makers who normally they'd be, you know, lost and stranded on their own. Uh, this, this really does create a community. It's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the, that's the benefit of, of that big community too, is you put your feelers out for the next studio, rumors of studio, right? That's right. And if anybody has a lead, I would love to hear it. <laughs> Yeah, heard it here, folks. <laughs> Absolutely. And is this your first crawl or second crawl? Have you been in the crawl every year, Gil? No, this is my first crawl. I've only actually been in Vancouver oh, wow. for three years. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. And what about you, Arlie? You've been in the crawl. I mean, you're, you've you been in the 20, crawl. 21 years. <laughs> <laughs> Did you invent the crawl? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> right? I, I feel like it's like I was thinking about it about you know the rhythm of your working and the rhythm of your seasons and like all this stuff and how the crawl has just become like part of I, yeah I don't know I it, it's just part of my my cycle um, and uh, yeah it, it everyone you know like they're like oh how are you doing everyone knows they don't talk to me like the week like this four weeks going up to the crawl like I, I'm too busy I can't do anything um so so yeah and but it is I find it a really great time to get feedback on my work but I tell myself I'm not going to change what I'm doing based on what people are saying but it is it is really nice to get some direct feedback um you can really tell you know what people are um attracted to and you know yeah wow. so it's it's a good um uh, yeah, that's the collection launch. So, okay, so what I'm doing this year is I'm going to launch an uh, online collection at the same time as I'm doing it during the crawl. Um, so I haven't done that before because um, I, I didn't really know how to do the online collection launches. This is something I learned during COVID. Um, so I'm going to see how that goes. Uh, so that's the collection there. Um, and uh, so I'll be showing it at the same time. So it'll be interesting to see what the online reaction is and the in-person reaction um, but yeah, I just kind of wanted to, to, to try doing them at the same time, see how that works. Mm -hmm. Looks pretty impressive to me. Read. Yeah, so I did, I guess I did do a consistent color palette, consistent theme, like what you were saying. Um, sometimes you feel like you're going all over the place, but, um, yeah. Looks pretty consistent. Without so being like a assembly line. Okay, yeah. Right? It's a bit of a, yeah, it, it's, it's hard to be prolific and not repetitive. Um, so yeah, so that's why sometimes I do switch to other medium and go back and forth between the two because you, you do feel like you've exhausted the, ide the new ideas in that at that time. So you have to take a little bit of break from that and then move to something else. Um, and then maybe that's why I moved to the business side for a little bit to kind of re-energize that because you're just really funneling what's in you in, you know, into the work. Um, and, and I don't, I don't have a consistent like flow of that, you know, 365. So it, it sometimes I, I do, I do find doing something monotonous, like, um, the web updates or whatever, it does give yourself a little bit of a break. I don't know if anyone else, I mean, no, you guys don't like doing it. <laughs> you already said that, but. <laughs> Looking for people to do it. <laughs> Does anyone else feel that way? <laughs> but, um, Jeff, yeah. what about what about you? Have you been, what, what crawl number is this for you? Or is it the first? This is like uh, number six, I think. Uh, I mean, I took space at Portside six years ago, I think six years ago, specifically to be in the crawl. It turned out to be a, a, a fantastic choice. I mean, the crawls, the, the premier event for, you know, Western Canada, as far as I'm concerned, for the visual arts. Um, and uh, it's always good to be part of it. I have to say that uh, I've 
over the years have become more and more blasé with my preparation. I'm going to start preparing tomorrow afternoon, uh, which maybe Esther doesn't want to hear, but there <laughs> it is. Um, so, but, you know, I don't, I'm just, I have like a whole bunch of stuff and I'll just take a selection from it, stick it up on the wall, sweep the floor, you know, put away the bodies and uh, and then we'll, we'll get going. Yeah. You know, but it's, yeah, I mean, it's, the crawls are a fantastic institution. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't know anybody who would think otherwise. Mm -hmm. I worry about the throngs of strangers. Oh, it's fine. You know, I mean, what's the worst that can happen? Everybody's double vaxxed, right? And uh, and uh, we've got bouncers in the door, you know. Um, so it'll be, it'll be super safe, mm -hmm. super safe. And everybody's going to behave themselves and and you know, um, your average your average art buyer, they're not likely to be, you know, rabid anti-vaxxers. Anti they're going to be pretty well behaved and respectful. Mm -hmm. You know, they're a good crowd. You know, yeah. Yeah. the numbers may be down a little bit, but if you're nervous, you can come um, during the appointments. You know, or if you're a little braver, you can come during the open session. But I think it'll be pretty safe. Mm -hmm. Well, it's amazing that the whole the the, the uh, crawl didn't stop during the pandemic. Oh well, yeah, was last year was so interesting doing all the the Matterport, the online. Um, oh yeah, I got all into that. That was that was a whole yeah. Um, the three hundred and sixty, the the three hundred and sixty virtual view of the studios, like it was a real. Um, it was just such a strange experience to feel like you 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 almost feel like a robot like you're trying to um and I still I still feel like that like I feel like that's really informed how I can like that's really changed the way I've marketed my work since then um you know figuring out that you know you can really do it via social media but I I have to say I don't enjoy that part that's a uh -huh. It's like a necessary thing, but I I, I think it's not healthy. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah. what can you do, right? It, mm -hmm. it, no, I thought it was a, a pretty good uh, pivot. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I found I didn't. Although there was there was nobody, I didn't really get involved in the in with like unlike Carly, she's a bit more with it. Uh, I just put my profile up and as it happens some character found me and came and bought a couple of paintings so I made, I made about the same sales as normal but without all the, the hassle of uh, shaking hands for four days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Gil how do you prepare for it? Oh I'm, I'm also going to sweep the floor and hide the bodies like Jeff. Good mm -hmm. man. Yeah I have a few, <laughs> uh, a few less hiding spots in my studio but I'll figure something out. Yeah well you don't have to do anything fancy right people are expecting a working studio. Uh, well, you know, uh, I, I often greet uh, customers in my studio for for just regular appointments outside of the crawl, and uh, I find that the less prepared I am, the more messy everything is, the more they're like, oh my god, it's an artist's studio, it's so wonderful. <laughs> so, yeah. Maybe I'm just going to mess the place up a little bit, throw a few things around, uh, splash some paint on the wall, I don't know. Do you find Stage. people spend a lot of time looking at your tools? Uh, they they do, uh, and you know what? I love it. Um, I, I love sharing that process. Uh, it, it's it's something that not everyone comes across in their day to day life if they're working a, an office job or whatever the case may be. And I'm always happy to share and show how everything is made. And I anticipate doing a lot of that during the crawl. Yeah, I can imagine that's a really important part of marketing. I hate this word marketing. Can I come up with a? Can we have a different word? But talking about your uh, work, putting in just sort of valuing your work when they can see actually see all the tools that go mm -hmm. into it. That I don't think people really give it much thought, you know, when you when they when they see handmade objects. More than than you sell your your work uh, quite often. Um, people aren't buying what you're painting or what you're making. People are are kind of buying a piece of you. That's that's what Very they good. really want. Very good way to end this talk, I have to say. Should, let's just go around and talk about your uh, when you're open and where you are, starting with you, Gil. 
Uh, I am open all days of the crawl. Um, I'm in the Chinatown Center at 288 East Georgia. It's in unit 120. Uh, the unit numbers are a little bit hard to find, but I have a feeling I'll be the only one with my doors wide open, so I should be pretty easy to track down. Uh, please come visit me because I think I'm the only participant in my building and I don't want to be lonely for the entire weekend. <laughs> so it's at, it's, where's the cross street? Where are you? At uh, East Georgia and Gore. Georgia and Gore. Is there a name of that studio? Is that the, is that uh, the it, building? It no. Used to be, I, I think it's still called the Chinatown Center. Oh, uh, okay. Chinatown has been transforming. Right, right. Very eyes. So <laughs> it's shifting. This, it's the shifting sands of Vancouver. Exactly. Right. Okay. Arlie? Um, I'm at 326 1000 Parker on the third floor. I'm not open for the preview weekend, but I'm open for the 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 whole weekend, the non-appointment weekend, 18th to the 21st. And our building actually has um, a 400 person at a time maximum. So if you're worried about it being crowded like it normally is at Parker Street, it, it won't be. Um, they're not allowing to have more than 400 people at a time. So, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And Jeff? Uh, I will be I will be one of 13 artists at Portside Studios um, at the intersection of Powell and, uh, and McLean. Tomorrow night, Saturday, Sunday, uh, by appointment. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, next weekend. Above a brewery. Uh, Above the brewery. Yeah. Oh, and I'm getting a yeah. junk call from China just now, I think. <laughs> so excuse the, the, the noise. <laughs> Okay. And um, everybody, um, double vax, bring your mask and wear your mask, correct? Yeah. Buy yes. one of our Lees. I don't yes. have any. I'm all sold out. Wow. That's a <laughs> nice problem to have. Nice problem. Okay, I was thanks. hoping we wouldn't need them anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Optimist. Uh, yeah, we thank you very much, you guys. It's great talking to all of you. We're going to wrap up this hour right now and um, have a great uh crawl and um yeah. i'm gonna be following all your future endeavors with your marketing and your business i'm gonna take some <laughs> tips i'm i'm inspired okay <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much for the opportunity carlin yeah You're thank welcome. you carlin always okay. lovely to talk to you bye good night bye, bye.